Right. Well, thank you, uh, Matthew, for getting that wonderful introduction. Let me just say, got it. Okay. You're recording. Excellent. Um, yeah. My name is Jillian and I'm based in Bimini in the Bahamas and I'm there because of sharks. Um, pretty much my entire adult life has revolved around these animals and uh, spending as much time with them as possible. And I always say, if I'm not in the water and studying sharks, I'm talking about them. So uh, they're really, really important to me. And today I'm gonna talk about uh, some of the techniques for studying them and why we're actually doing it. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's just get going. Okay. So studying sharks, how and why, uh, this is a very broad topic. Um, so I could spend days. Um, it's an incredibly diverse field of science. And so um, I'll just kind of highlight aspects of it because it would take days to talk about the diverse and dynamic world of how and why we actually study sharks. Um, yes, yeah, so like I said, I'm based in the Bahamas and spend a lot of time photographing, filming sharks, also different research projects. I'm a mom, so I'm also wrestling my near three-year-old daughter um, who loves the water, um, I think almost as much as I do, which is amazing. And uh, so, yeah, so these animals keep me very busy. They keep me in the ocean. And it's really, really incredible to be able to not only study them, spend time with them, but really share it with other people. And because there's a lot of misinformation out there about sharks um, and why they're important or, or why we're doing this. Why is there so much attention? I mean, obviously July, uh, Matthew was just mentioning July Shark Fest, it's Shark Week airs, it's Shark Awareness Day. Um, it's a very sharky month. So why are we talking about all this? Why are we caring? Why are we putting so many, so much energy and resources into actually studying these animals? So um, just a couple of clips just to show you spending time. A lot of people ask me and I show a lot of the same stuff to kids. These are sub adult lemon sharks. We have an area where we can spend time with them, do observations um, and we're looking at sizes. We can understand male, female relationships. How many are using that space? This applies to much bigger sharks as well. So um, Bimini is in the Bahamas and it's, which is considered the shark diving capital of the world. So. People from all over the globe travel there to see these animals up close. If any of you are divers and you're interested or snorkeling, it's there's shallow water, amazing experiences. Um, it's a really, really incredible place to visit and experience all different species, all different levels of diving, but very, very beautiful, incredible place. So when we talk about studying sharks, there's over 500 different species. So that's our first challenge is they're weird, they're wonderful, they live in different habitats, they have different behaviors. Yes, they're all sharks, but because of the different depths they're at, the different habitats, uh, their migration patterns, locations, um, that's where the challenges can arise for it isn't a one size fits all approach to studying sharks. And so because of that, that's when I was saying there's so many different aspects to that. So you could be talking about genetic work in the lab, talking about other research being done in labs with uh, live animals, aquariums out in the field. So it varies incredibly around the world and depending on the species, depending on the questions that are being asked. So uh, far too much information to share in one brief talk. So I'm going to highlight some of the stuff that I've been working on. And if you've watched any of the shows on Shark Fest or Shark Week or documentaries, a lot of times they are talking about tagging and tracking sharks. And so what are we using to do that? Why are we doing it? Why are we actually studying these animals at all? And so you may be familiar with it. There's a lot of different methods. I've mentioned a few different things. So what your idea of what shark science looks like may vary um, and might not look anything like this. This is a lot of field work. As I mentioned, I've not spent time. I'm not, I've not worked in the lab. I'm not a geneticist. Uh, my experience has been in the field. And then I ship my genetics off to a lab to be analyzed by someone who specializes in that. So as technology is changing, so isn't our approach of how we study animals. Ideally, we wouldn't have to touch these animals at all, ever. That's not 
where we're at as far as conservation status for sharks and a lot of other animals around the world. It would be amazing if we could let these animals just live their lives and their populations would thrive and be okay. That's not the reality of what is happening in our world today. So different techniques are, are, have been developed. Um, something like this is Dr. Greg Skomel. He works out of Massachusetts, is a friend of ours, incredible. My husband who films for a lot of TV shows has worked with him quite a bit. And so here he is pole tagging a great white. So some of the methods to study sharks mean that we're not actually catching them, we're not physically handling, touching, and being minimally invasive. So we don't really want to stress the animal out. And so the, the least amount of stress we can put on the animal, the better. And that's really all the techniques that have been developed, uh, the methods for capture, things we're doing. The whole idea is to try and keep that animal safe, keep ourselves safe, um, and to minimize the impact. We are obviously impacting that animal in some way, but we want to minimize it to the fact that we want them to continue to thrive so we can actually learn something. Now, if we are going to work in the field and capture sharks, there's several different methods that are quite common. Um, what we've discovered in the Turks and Caicos for Project Lemonade, which is our kind of fun name for we're studying baby lemon sharks, is catching them with a net. So this is actually probably the least stressful, the easiest. We're looking. So Phil is standing there actually watching because we've notched their fins, and I'll explain that in a bit. So we're trying to catch ones that we haven't caught already, which is great. We're not repeating capture day after day while we're there. We've caught them once, we've got our data, we've let them go. So this obviously wouldn't work for a 13 foot tiger shark if you're trying to study them. But in this situation for baby lemon sharks, it's actually quite ideal. Takes some patience, takes a little bit of bait to get them to come hang out with us, a big net and a lot of patience. Really that's, that's the key to it. Other methods are more traditional fishing. Um, some scientists do use fishing poles, depends on the species. Um, we also use drum lines and long lines. A drum line has a weight on the bottom with a buoy at the top. And we use circle hooks when we're fishing for sharks. If you guys have been fishing before, you've probably used a J hook. Circle hooks, as you can see, are a bit more rounded. It's designed so if they do get swallowed, they're not catching on things. They can move in and out, not damaging down if the shark does swallow it. And ideally it's gonna hook on one side of the mouth or the other. They're also designed to rust so that we're not leaving extra jewelry in the shark more than we're gonna put in with tags. And for some reason, if we can't cut that barb and pull that hook out, eventually it will come out. Now this allows the shark to swim. Some sharks have to swim to breathe. They have to move their entire life moving forward in order to um, have their mouth open. They're ram ventilators, they're ramming the water in. Other animals, other sharks can actually rest on the bottom. They can buccal pump. But when we're fishing in an area, we don't actually know. We might know 10 species we're gonna catch, but we don't know on the day which particular shark might bite that hook. So we have to, they have to be able to swim. These are left for about 90 minutes and then we're checking our lines. Then we'll rebate and do it again over the course of a day. Long lines, this isn't the best graphic. Um, we usually have them much more spread out. Um, long lines, if you've heard about commercial fishing and how damaging they are, yes. Miles and miles, thousands and thousands of hooks just left in the ocean for hours and hours and hours, catching everything can be extremely um, deadly and devastating in, a certain, in an area. What we're doing is 90 minutes to four hours, anywhere from 15 to 20 hooks, and the lines that the hooks be on are much longer, again, allowing the sharks to swim. But it is a long line, and we can set it towards the bottom. We can have a surface one. We can adjust where it is depending on the type of sharks we are targeting in that particular area. Now, once we have a shark, um, really around the world, pretty much, it's a base start when you catch a shark, it's called a scientific workup. And this is pretty common, pretty standardized around the world, no matter what type of species you're working for. There's very specific data that is collected kind of first and foremost. There might be other stuff collected beyond that, but we're gonna start out with these basics. So we can either secure the animal next to the boat. You can see that circle hook is there. If we are securing it next to the boat. We are gonna get a rope around the tail so the animal cannot thrash. If it's small, we can bring it into the boat, into that um, tub of water to work with it. And really 
once this starts, it's if you've watched um, a race, a car race, NASCAR or something, and the pit crew comes in and they change the tires, they do the field, do everything. Everyone knows their job. We work very, very quickly to collect the data and let the shark go. So you can see here this bull shark secured next to the boat. And the first thing we're going to do is measure the shark. So it does have that rope around the tail. And you can see tape measure might be the exact same tape measure. It's just a soft one that you can get at Home Depot. You can see it here. Sometimes if they're small enough, we can leave them right in the water, hold on to them, do it really, really quickly. And these are the measurements we're taking. We're taking total length, which is the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. Um, the fork length, which is the tip of the nose to where the tail forks. Think of a shark fin like this, kind of that point. Unless you have something like a nurse shark, they don't have the bottom part of that tail. So we don't actually take that. And then the tip of the nose to right at the tail starts the pre-caudal length. The tail fin is called the caudal fin. So it's the pre-caudal. And we do this to get a bender understanding of size, but also say the total length is affected because they're missing part of that fin. And say it's been injured, it's bitten off, it's gone. Um, so we can't get that. But if we know the other measurements, we can kind of estimate the total length based on that. Next up, we take a DNA sample. Now this can be taken from a couple different locations on the fin. And I mentioned we were looking at that when we were catching the little lemons. You see on this little lemon shark, there's a triangular notch. That's not natural. We cut that. We took our DNA sample from the fin. And it's probably about the size of your thumbnail, and it goes in a little vial. We ship these off to a lab in Chicago, and Dr. Kevin Feldheim is uh, sort of a foremost expert on um, genetic analysis. So sometimes it's taken from the trailing edge, and what this does is it's the shark's DNA. So what we're doing is we're, we're creating family trees. Sharks do not stay together, so if this, all these little lemon sharks we're capturing, we don't know if they're siblings or not. And we won't actually know until we look at their DNA. And then from that, we can figure out how many litters, just like a litter of puppies or kittens, were in that area, which then tells us how many mothers came into that area. So how many are using that? And then over time, if you can go back year after year after year, it's then possible the baby sharks you caught reach an age where they come back and give birth. We know this exists in the Bahamas that adult females go back to the mangroves they were born in. We do not know if that's what's happening in Turks and Caicos, but we're hoping to find out. And actually in this region, there hasn't been much work at all. So this is really a baseline study to understand what is going on with this species in this kind of habitat we're working in, in these mangroves and looking at how development's gonna affect that, fishing, because it's still legal to take these sharks there. And so, using that DNA is really, really important. Now, if you also take a little bit of tissue from under the dorsal fin and blood, you can start to look at diet. And there's things called stable isotopes. Uh, think about carbon and nitrogen. They're present. And if there's a certain amount, you can figure out what the shark's essentially been eating for up to an entire year. So there's scientists that specialize in that, looking at stable isotopes to understand the diet, which then can tell us What's their favorite restaurant? Where are these sharks hanging out? Are they always in the seagrass? Are they using the coral reefs? Are they moving in and out of habitats? Are they more opportunistic? Are they specialized? So just kind of taking these little bits of tissue and blood can actually tell us a lot about the animal. Now, those are very, very basic um, collection of data. We might also do girth measuring around the shark, sort of where the shark's armpits would be. Um, and then we'll start looking at tags. We might also um, collect bacteria from a gill swab or a mouth swab, uh, blood analysis um, to look at stress hormones. Um, we're also looking at the health of the shark. If there's an injury, parasites, some scientists are looking at parasites, they pull the parasites off and those are gonna be studied. So really that shark workup, um, which is essentially physical or checkup at the doctor's office is the basis. And then the other questions that might be being asked, um, it, it kind of goes from there. So it can be far more extensive, a lot of other information collected, but that's really the basic start. And that's what's done all over the world, every different type of species. Now, before we let the shark go, we are going to tag it. So there's lots and lots of different tags. And as technology is changing, 
so isn't the way we study animals, whether they live in the water or on land. It's really, really incredible. So some of the tags are very small and very inexpensive. And then we work our way up to the ones that are much more expensive. Um, so these are pit tags. This is what we're using on our lemon sharks. You can see the size of the little one right in my hand. If any of you have a cat or dog at home that's microchipped in case it gets lost, this is the exact same thing. All right, so the reader would be the Humane Society or your vet has. It's injected just between the shoulder blades of your cat or dog, has your family's phone number and address. Right? We're not trying to find lost sharks. We're just giving them a name tag. We know these last at least 20 years. We inject it with a syringe just under the dorsal fin. So if it's a project where we're using these or we know someone in the area has been, we're going to scan that shark during the workup and find out, did, has this been tagged before or Nope, it hasn't, we're going to tag it. Now you can see there's a long series of numbers there. That's the shark's name tag, essentially. So we record that and then hopefully we catch the shark again. That's really the only way to get any information um, from this tag. It's really, we have to catch the shark again, remeasure it, did it move to a location? So a lot of the pretty inexpensive, simple tags, you have to have access to that animal again. So here we are. Scanning it, Candace is holding it. So Candace and Duncan, these are team members on the project. Um, just holding it quickly, doing a scan. The next tag, another very simple one, these are cattle tags. So if you've ever seen a cow or a pig or some sort of farm animal with a tag in its ear, these are the exact same things. Now, sharks do have ears, but they're inside the head. So we wouldn't very easily um, be able to pierce them. But the fin, because it's just that cartilage, is actually why you're seeing all these tags in and around that fin. It makes it an ideal working place um, because there's not the nerve endings there. So we don't want to um, harm the animal. We don't want it to impact their swimming. So it kind of is flush with that. And on the back side of these tags will be an email, a phone number. So one, we catch the shark again. Great, remeasure it, um, see if it's changed location, learn about growth rates. Two, somebody else sees it, a scuba diver, takes a photo, contacts us, another shark scientist. Or if a fisherman catches it, either lets us know, they decide to keep the animal, lets us know, or they let the animal go, right? They record the data, they let the animal know, go. And this is just showing, um, when I mentioned recapturing the shark to get the data, so this is just so that's just from I'm gonna kind of do this before we go into some of the bigger tags, but that's when I mentioned recatching the sharks. So what was really exciting, and I was just there two weeks ago, um, I just, or I've been back two weeks, and this was our second year of the project, and we do have some recaptures, which means sharks that we tagged last year. So now we can look at growth rates, and also we can understand how long are these little sharks using that mangrove nursery? Because we know it varies in locations, some of them five to seven years, Others, it's much shorter. They have to grow quicker and go out into deeper water sooner because there's not enough space, all right? And so as the other sharks come in, they're moving out. And also competition for food can drive them out as well. Just a little bit more. This is just a little quick um, blurb about the project. Julian, we can't, we can't hear the sound on these, by the way. Oh, okay. Mm, well, you don't really, okay, so I'll just, I'll just explain it then. Um, I'll start it over. So myself and Candace talking about the project. Ah, hang on, why is that not going back to there? I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I don't know why the audio is not playing. Hang on, let me see if I go back and then start. It. So essentially, um, I'm just saying this is our project. And it's Project Lemonade in Turks Caicos. That's a bruv, one of our pieces of equipment I'm going to talk about. It's just really showing kind of the, there's the drum line going in. Mangroves, these little sharks. Talk about pit tags. Measuring. 
And then I'll share a link with you guys as well. We have a link on the website so you can learn a little bit more about it. Okay, so that's what we're using. Very simple tags for that project. They're small animals as well. Now, other simple tags, you have a spaghetti tag at the top, Casey dart tag at the bottom. These have darts that go under the skin and they're really secure. You can see those fancy pieces of wood and everybody in my hand and uh, the other guy down there. Um, and we kind of just pop it in. It's not fancy. A lot of our science equipment is just, we build it. Um, you make something because it doesn't exist and you need it. So you create it or build it or get uh, like creative and find a way to make it work. So that goes underneath and you can see the series of numbers and then actually the, the tube you see can twist open and there's a little piece of paper with um, a place that's got, it's got phone number, email, I can't remember exactly what, it depends on where you are. Um, and so again, photograph it, um, somebody else sees it, we catch it again, fishermen. So really these tags, they're inexpensive. We have to catch the animal again. Um, we can just, it's just really a basic, identification for us, but then hopefully we are able to capture the animal again. Now, very simplistic tags, technology is incredible. And so as it's changing and engineers are working and developing new methods to study animals, it's getting really, really amazing what we can do. This is a Fitbit for sharks. So think of your watch, right? Keeps track of your steps. This is not seeing if the shark hits its 10,000 steps for the day. Um, it's counting tail beats. So what you can do is put this on a shark. It has to be a shark that you know you're going to be able to catch again. So an area um, in the mangroves, you can observe the shark, leave this on for three to five days, catch the shark, take it off. And then you can match that with observations done in a captive setting. And really what it's trying to do is look at an ethogram, activity budget. Okay, how does this animal spend its day? How much time is it resting? How much time is it hunting? How much time is it, you know, actively searching for food or trying not to become food? And, you know, if you have a cat or dog at home, think about their activity budget, All right? My dog's getting a bit older, so there's a lot more sleeping and kind of lounging around in the comfiest spot for her activity budget. And so it's really just helping us how, understand how these animals spend their day. What are they doing? Um, and how they might be utilizing that habitat or social behaviors with certain species like these little lemon sharks that are actually quite social, have their best buddies when they're small. So are they hunting with one friend and then hiding out with another? Next up, as far as tech goes, we're looking at acoustic tags. And acoustic means they make a noise. We cannot hear it. The sharks do not hear it. Think of it like a ringtone on a phone. It's unique for each tag, but it's actually a series of beats. And these tags vary in size. We would not put the largest one in a very small shark. The small one would not work in a large shark. So different sizes based on um, the size of the animal as well. But there are certain devices that do listen for these tags. So they can go on the outside of the shark, see in the base of this great hammerhead. And the device sticking out of the sand is a receiver. It's an ear that listens only for these tags. We can set a perimeter and anytime an animal passes through, that it's usually 300 to 500 meters around, uh, that computer inside that waterproof case is recording the time of day, the water temperature, the tag number, and the date. So really this technology starts um, to, to be the way that we're spying on sharks. We don't have to be right there watching them but it's telling us, are they showing up in that same area every day at three o'clock? Or they show up at some point during the day, or we tagged them, they pass through, we never see them again, okay? So really kind of helping us understand habitat use, social structures, and the impact of things like in the Bahamas, shark feeding sites where they're fed and they come in to that provisioning site and they're conditioned to learn that if they come to that spot at a certain time, they're probably going to get a free snack. These can also go inside the shark. So if you flip a shark over, they go in a sleep-like state called tonic immobility, and it's anesthesia for sharks. So if you've had surgery, you know someone who has, because we would never be able to do this to a shark if they could feel it. 
So they go into the sleep-like state. We make a small incision kind of in the abdomen um, and we slide that tag in. These are the same sutures, they're human grade, a um, couple stitches, flip it over, shark does not feel it, has no idea what happened, swims off. And for about 10 years, that tag is gonna give off those pings, those beeps. And the shark's not hearing it um, and it's not feeling it. They heal very, very quickly. I've caught a shark four days later. It was closed up, not fully healed. You can still see it, but it was closed up. Um, they heal incredibly quickly. Um, so this is a very, very excellent um, method. And it's done really quickly. Um, I don't do it as much anymore, um, but I know people that can do this in about 90 seconds. So very, very fast. This video just kind of shows what, whoops, hang on, what the, the receiving looks like. So Cal State University Long Beach has a shark lab and they're studying great whites and they've created all these really cool little animations. So I use these with students, but it's also just a really great way to uh, understand how the tags work. There's an external, there you go, okay. Now the next couple of tags I'm gonna show you are kind of the last two are satellite tags. So these are pop-off satellite tags. Um, they're PSATs, they're an archival tag, which means they store data just like a SIM card or a flash drive. So they're looking at things like depth, um, GPS location. And, and so if the tag is recording that, it stays on the animal for a set amount of time, and then it's going to pop off float to the surface, and that antenna is gonna transmit the information to satellites. So we can get the information, some of it from the satellites, but if we get the tag back, we get 100% of the data. The data from the satellites can range anywhere from about 30 to about 80% of the tag data. So ideally, put a little reward on there and, and we can get the tag back, but the ocean is a big place. Um, so literally it's not the needle in the haystack, it's the needle in the ocean. But they do wash ashore um, and we do often get them back if um, there, it's kind of in a region that we know the sharks are sort of using that, that area um, and they're close enough shore and they end up washing ashore. So the shark just kind of swims around. And this is great for animals that spend time at depth, um, species that are migrating, um, but certainly doesn't have to be a shark that comes to the surface because the tag eventually is going to pop up to the surface and transmit that information to the satellites. And the last tag, another type of satellite tag is a spot tag. You can see the green bit there is a computer and there are batteries. We bolt this onto the fin of the shark. It will eventually migrate through. Um, it's very, very flush on there, and there'll be things like an anti-algae coating on it so it doesn't get a whole ecosystem on top of the tag. And I always like to say this is sort of an iPhone for sharks, but they're not shopping online, getting directions. They're swimming around, and this has to be put, or doesn't have to, but you're losing your money and not getting your data if a shark doesn't come to the surface. So if you've seen the apps, OSEARCH has one, Guy Harvey Research Institute, where you can track the sharks. These are the tags. And there's a sensor on the side. And when it touches the air, it submit, um, sends out a signal uh, to a satellite with the GPS location. Now, the accuracy of that varies depending on how many satellites are in proximity. And so it has to be things like tiger sharks, oceanic white tips, makos, great whites, animals that do come to the surface, um, at least some of the time. Uh, one of the tiger sharks I put these on, she didn't come to the surface again for three months. So it was a little nerve wracking because what happened, where did she go? And then it's really tricky because point one was here and then point one was here too. And we have no idea what she did in between. So it doesn't tell us necessarily as much information as we had wanted, right? And this is attaching it to a tiger shark. And this just shows as well, we are, we do drill holes to attach this. Um, shark's not flinching around. And this was actually, this research project was featured on Shark Week quite a few years ago. Another little animation to show it. And the shark doesn't actually write us a lovely email. We just get the location. 
And then we can run it on uh, Google Earth. The green dot is where this tiger shark got her tag. And this was, we tagged her just off of Seba in the Dutch Caribbean. And she was mm, just less than nine feet in length. So she was still young, not a mature adult. And all those green dots, she was probably going after a turtle or a bird, something at the surface and she was feeding. And then she starts heading towards South America. You'll see it start to go yellow and red. That's the particular track time period we wanted to look at. She wore this tag for almost four years. So we have a much bigger track. This was just that set period we were trying to view. And this project was looking at where these females go. Now, she was not a mature adult, so she could not be pregnant. But we were also looking at where do they go, um, their migration routes, where are they giving birth? Because they're protected in certain aspects of that journey, but they're not protected in other areas. So if we figure out this route is the same and we can figure out kind of where these big females are going to give birth, that is an area we're definitely going to want to get better protection put in place so those babies at least have a chance to survive. And just to kind of wrap up with some of the other tech that's being used, cameras are really, really incredible. And there's all different variations of how we're using them to study sharks. It's one of my favorite things to do is just photograph sharks. They're beautiful. I love being in the water with them and being able to spend time with bigger sharks as well. Um, Bimini, we have this incredible great hammerhead dive and they're really, really beautiful, incredible animals uh, that I love getting to spend time with. And cameras are also, part of it is, is taking photos and, but also it's documenting science, right? It's, it's telling the story. If you've watched shark science on TV, it's helping understand why we're doing this or what's happening. So it's also a tool to document the research, all right? All aspects of it, what's going on. And now with social media, phones, even a tool for observations or also for scientists to then communicate what they're doing, why people are doing lives from the field and really just um, helping the general public have a better idea of why they're doing this. Um, because sometimes it can seem really vague and you know, I get questions all the time, why are you poking holes in sharks? Well, if we don't take the time to explain that, um, then people won't, you can't expect people to understand it. And you also can't expect them to support you and support your work in the form of, you know, sharing that information, donations, grants, funding, things like that, uh, if people don't really understand the why or what's happening. So the hammerheads, for example, um, are very, very unique. And because Bimini is such a special place, and it's that we know of the only place in the world where you get multiple great hammerheads, a normally solitary species that come together. I've seen 11 on a dive and they've been ID'd and named. So for example, the one on the far left is Atlas on the far bottom left. He's one of the only males. Uh, the top right is Luska. The bottom right is Scylla. Um, and I got to name Luska because I'm the only person that has photographed her. Um, we only saw her that one time she came in she didn't come around. Nobody else divers the research station have. So um, I got to name her Luska. Um, the others are mostly Greek gods and goddesses, but I figured that was kind of a cool name. It's a Lucayan legend of a sea monster that lived in the Bahamas that was half shark, half octopus. So, um, and uh, just a really beautiful color, but you can see their unique markings underneath, um, scars, freckles, same things that make us unique. The sharks have as well the coloration porcilla has a split fin that's they healed up quite nicely but still has that scar she also has really unique markings underneath now in the little video you saw that kind of frame being dropped into the water that's a bruv a baited remote underwater video system another way to spy on sharks we have a frame a bait cage we put it in and we leave it and now with GoPros, it can run for about an hour, maybe a little bit more. And then we look at the videos and see what showed up. So we can, and these are actually some students on the project. Um, a big part of what we're doing with Project Lemonade is actually taking high school students out with us. So this past trip, we just took 20 students out to tag sharks to help us set brubs and get involved with all aspects of the research. So a lot of hands-on learning, which is really exciting. And so they're setting the brub there. And we're looking at 
predator prey dynamics. So how many predators, how many sharks or other bigger fish? Uh, what are the prey species that are there? Fish abundance. Uh, so it tells us a lot about what's in the area um, as far as kind of just the biodiversity as well. And so it's a way of spying on the sharks because we're not, once it's set, we're not there. So we're not blowing bubbles, we're not snorkeling around and splashing around, it's dropped in and we leave it. These can be set on the bottom, they can drift. There's all different um, ways that they can be set depending on the depths. This one is a homemade bruv that a friend of ours did off Bimini. Uh, so you can see it's kind of just a stick with a dead fish strapped to it. Very basic, but got some really cool footage. And it does have a line to the surface with the buoy. This big jack comes in and can't quite figure it out. Big male tiger shark comes in. And then sort of finishes up the snack and takes it for a little spin. So in that situation, it's kind of because it's so deep, just cool to see what was down there. And um, there was obviously video lights um, and yeah, just to see what comes in at depth because we're not scuba diving down at that depth unless you have an ROV or submarine or something to go to those depths. Um, you're really limited in understanding what's down there, but by sending cameras down, we can learn a lot. Then we can also put the sharks to work. So we can also use fin cameras. This particular model really looks like a camera strapped to some barbecue tongs. Barbecue tongs are sealed around the fin. They've got a magnesium strip that corrodes and pops off after a certain amount of time. Some of them even have kind of infrared, so night vision cameras. The technology is changing every year. They're, you know, there's new stuff. Even now people are putting just GoPros and something as simple as a GoPro. And the shark swims around. It either pops off or it's removed from the shark. And essentially we get to spy on the shark. So where are they going? How are they spending their time? Are they interacting with other sharks? Are they hunting? Um, and so just kind of a cool way to understand a little bit more about how they're spending their time and their habitat use and really just understanding what these animals are doing and where they're going. So all of this, the tags, the cameras, genetics, all of this and much more that I didn't even touch upon. We're doing this because these animals are important. First off, they're a very valuable animal in our ocean ecosystems. Maybe some of you have talked about food chains and food webs recently. Maybe for some of us, it's been a while, but um, yeah, it's, it's understanding their place in the system. They're not all apex predators, but they do play an important role in controlling prey populations, prey density, prey distribution. And, and so understanding how that works um, is important, but keeping that balance, those ecosystems healthy and balanced is the job of these animals. And it's a really, really important job. But unfortunately, humans are impacting this. So this number, 100 million sharks are killed globally each year. It's probably lower uh, than the actual numbers. This was done quite a few years ago. So as of now, it's probably a bit higher. Sharks are targeted for their fins, but that is not the only thing. Um, go to GNC, Walgreens, Target. You can find shark cartilage pills, um, jaws, souvenirs. People eat shark. The grocery store, depending on where you're at, might sell shark. And so all over the world, these animals are being targeted. They're also um, being caught. Uh, overfishing is really what's driving this, taking too many out, whether they're targeted or they're caught as bycatch, meaning they're not what the fishermen are trying to catch, but they're catching them anyways. And these are just some other things. And now we're realizing a recent study was done that over one third of sharks and rays and skates and chimeras are threatened with extinction. Right. So, and this has gone up and it keeps going up. So other things, climate change, pollution, habitat loss. Um, I talked about long lines earlier. 
This is essentially what can happen fishing for tuna, but catching a lot of other things as well. Nets, um, you can see other species of shark in there. The, and then obviously they're trying to catch the fish, uh, not the sharks, but the sharks are caught as well. Ropey, big, beautiful white shark that I had the pleasure of diving with is wearing a rope. Now, it obviously went on when she was smaller and she grew and it cut into her gills. So um, not ideal. Divers were able to cut most of it off, but she is still wearing that. So all this debris and trash that ends up in the ocean. I've dissected sharks. There's plastic in their stomach. And now to the point that they're eating it, fish are eating it. So we're eating it. Um, this is a huge problem all over the world for all marine life and for us on, on the earth as well on land. Climate change is also affecting them. So studying them is helping us understand how this is affecting sharks. We're seeing them migrate in different times, earlier, later, going further north, further south, closer to shore as their food is moving, right? So this, this is affecting sharks. So in order to understand that, we need to study them. Coastal development. This is now a hotel in Bimini. That was a beautiful mangrove area, an important nursery habitat for lots of animals, including baby sharks. It's now a hotel and a casino. So what we're seeing now is more and more of these species listed as critically endangered. Next stop, extinction. So this is, this is really the why. So we know they're important. We know there are so many threats that are facing our ocean. Um, and facing these animals. And despite the fact that they've been around, they have these incredible adaptations, they can't out swim and out compete what we're doing. And for example, understanding the little lemon sharks in that mangrove area, that mangrove area could potentially be developed in the future. So we need to understand, we need to have this data um, in order to get better laws and policy put in place. And this study just recently came out, um, actually a few days ago, and they looked at using bruvs and they were looking at reefs. So they're now seeing these reef sharks um, are declining. And so I think they did this in 67 countries and ultimately the five most common species of reef shark, including Caribbean reef shark and the nurse shark um, are declining. So that's going to impact the health of those coral reefs, which is going to impact other fish stocks, which is going to impact fisheries, people who make their livelihood off of those areas, um, whether it be to feed their family or dive in ecotourism. So um, this is a really, really significant study and scientists all over the world work together to come up with this. And it's really amazing to see that much data pooled together to create a global picture. A lot of times it's a very um, small niche that we may understand, but this is really a global picture. And the message is these animals are in trouble. And I love sharks, they're incredible. But in order to get better laws put in place, create these shark sanctuaries that exist, the Bahamas, sharks are protected. It's illegal to catch and kill them. But they swim over to Florida, not protected. So um, the data is needed to establish these sanctuaries, establish better policies, fisheries management. So if it's a no-take zone or a certain limit on take of any type of, of fish, um, including sharks, are, are also establishing CITES protection, um, either global or regional protections, all of this research, we can't simply go to governments and say, we love sharks, we need to protect them. They need data, they need to understand what's happening to populations, what's happening to habitats in order to actually get better policy, better protection put in place. And so that's ultimately why we're doing this. Um, certain projects have very specific goals. Um, certain projects may have more of a human animal interaction aspect, um, ecotourism, you know, different elements, but it's really ultimately to understand these animals in order to protect them, to get better policy and fisheries management put in place so that more and more of these sharks are not becoming extinct. All right. So if I don't know if anyone has any questions about working, um, this is all sharks for kids. That's usually the, the best place to check up on what we're doing. Um, there's a lot of stuff. If you're interested in seeing some updates on Project Lemonade, uh, you can check that out. We have a page just for that. Um, so we'll, we do 
are pretty active on our social media pages as well and posting updates and, and what's going on. And there's ways to follow and see some of the sharks and the kids out involved in the work as well. So definitely check those out if, if you want to reach out as well. But um, if anyone has any questions now about any of the research or just sharks in general. I'll ask a question. Um, so when you showed the video of the fish on a stick and the, I think it was a tiger shark came along and, and snagged the bait, as it was eating, its eyes rolled back in its head. Can you, was, is that a, a common thing? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so it's called the nictitating membrane. Um, some sharks have it. It's essentially an eyelid um, that comes up over when they're biting. So if you've ever heard people say sharks bite blind, they have excellent vision, but at the last second and things like great whites, they'll actually roll their eye back. They don't have that, but they roll their eye back. Others have that membrane that comes up to protect them because sometimes their food, oh, there we go. Sometimes their food um, doesn't want to become lunch. So it claws, bites, bites back, and they wanna be able to protect their eyes. And so they'll actually do that. They'll actually roll their, um, either roll the eye or that membrane that comes up. Looks like it's winking at you, but it's just, it comes from the bottom up. Neat. Thank you. Amazing work, Jillian. Thanks so much. Yeah, well, thanks, sir. Question. I have a quick question. Uh, Bimini sounds, if I said it right, sounds like a fantastic place. Are there other sites like that? Um, so the Bahamas in general is really very sharky um, for snorkeling, for diving. Uh, some species are found all throughout things like nurse sharks, Caribbean reef sharks, but then you have pockets. Um, the great hammerheads tend to be a, it's a Bimini thing. Uh, Tiger Beach is off Grand Bahama. It's a tiger shark dive. Um, and then you have the oceanic white tips off Cat Island, very seasonal. Tiger sharks are more or less year round. The hammerheads are winter months. They migrate in, they come up from deeper water and actually come into the shallows. We do have two tiger sharks that are now regularly hanging out on the hammerhead dive as well. Um, which is exciting. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so you do have a lot of very incredible shark interaction opportunities throughout the Bahamas. It's clear water, shallow sites. The weather for the most part is pretty good. It does get colder in the winter. People always laugh when I say it gets colder, but it does, I promise you. Um, and I know it's the Bahamas, but it still gets colder for us. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, and so in the colder months, it's actually sharkier in Bimini. So we see the bull sharks, we see the hammers, um, the black tips, uh, and so it's it's my favorite time of year. Um, so that's but yeah, year round in the Bahamas, there are places that you can go see sharks, either snorkeling or diving. And you listed a, a, a stack of problems. Um, what do you see as Maybe, what am I trying to say? What do you see as small things that uh, people could be doing to, to try to surmount some of these issues that are affecting sharks? Yeah, I mean, it's overwhelming when we start talking about all those issues, pollution, climate change, right? It's, it's very easy to go, it's too much. It's really overwhelming, but um, really simple things, learning about sharks, for one, there's so much misinformation. They're not man eaters. On average, about five people die from shark bites in the world each year. It's very, very rare. Um, but there's this fear that creates sort of um, an atmosphere of people not caring because if they're afraid of something, it's really difficult to try and do something to, to help that animal. Um, but I really do believe that learning about them, sharing that information, um, and then using less plastic, it really is a thing. Um, it, it really does. It's affecting all of this. And plastic is just becoming more and more of a problem. We're seeing it in these big, um, you know, marine animals and megafauna and big predators. And so that, but I think also sharing the information. I teach kids because I really believe that they're going to grow up and do better than we have and, and make a change. So um, you guys in the group, in the club, like, read a shark book at a library or a school. Um, go volunteer some time there to, to share that. Um, we have lots of resources on our website, coloring pages, fun things, just to help kids learn and get excited. And so uh, avoiding shark products. Um, there are some toxins. I mean, people do eat shark. And like other um, 
you know, fish and marine life, there's an acceptable level. If you've talked about mercury and toxins, we can get mercury poisoning. That's why they tell you the kind of the safe seafood list of best choices if you're going to eat seafood, but avoiding shark products um, and avoiding shark if you can. Uh, I mean, that's a good thing as well. And making sure you're, if you eat seafood, you're choosing sustainable because it might not just be that that's sustainable, but how it's caught might be bycatch for another species. So really kind of understanding where your seafood's coming from and not being afraid to ask those questions of what is the fish of the day and what is this catch of the day or sharks often mislabeled and, and called other things. And so I think not being afraid to ask those questions and to understand where our food in general is coming from, but our seafood. Um, yeah. Thanks. I think you have some other questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah, I see in the Adrian, yeah, I see in the chat. So, um, so yes, there are species um, that do that. So, for example, the sand tiger shark is probably the most well known, and they essentially eat their kind of not fully developed siblings uh, in utero. So it's a survival of the fittest before life in the ocean even starts. So absolutely, that does happen. Um, and thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. And ah, the hammerhead, yes. So the hammerhead is um, my favorite shark, by the way, and in my opinion, the most impressive animal on the planet. That cephalofoil is uh, a super powered center. So it looks really strange, but it has a lot of functions. First off, um, sharks have ampullae of Lorenzini. They're electroreceptors. It's often referred to as like their sixth sense and they can feel the heartbeat of an animal. So a stingray fish is buried in the sand, shark doesn't see it, hear it, smell it, but when it gets close, it can feel its heartbeat, right? Because the heartbeat doesn't stop. Think of a metal detector, but the shark's not trying to find lost jewelry, it's finding lunch. And so because of the shape and size of the head, more surface area, they actually have more of those, right? So first kind of superpower. The position of their eyes, they have excellent vision, almost 360 degrees. And they swim in that S shape, if you saw in that camera, back and forth. A um, couple small blind spots, but pre up and above and below near 360 degrees. It's a super powered vision. It puts their nostrils, their nares out wide. So it increases the ease of determining where a scent is coming from. And then they also use it to pin down stingrays. So um, really just super center of, of being able to find food and eat for that animal. Anything else? I have one last question. So, and you touched on this. When you are in a seafood restaurant, what do you order? Um, I don't usually eat seafood out at restaurants. Um, but when I'm because I mean I do eat seafood when I'm in the Bahamas because it's either we've gotten it ourselves or our friends, my husband does fish, we have a lot of friends that fish. Um, and so it's very easy to be selective, but I would say things, depending on where you are, um, things like snapper that are fast growing, they reproduce often, they mature quickly. Um, same thing with mahi mahi. So it really depends on your region, um, but it's a good idea to ask and they should know. And if a restaurant doesn't know, it's not necessarily their fault, but maybe it will drive them to start thinking better about where their, their fish is coming from. But you can ask how it's caught, um, where it's coming from, um, things, you know, tuna, is it line caught versus net? Um, and so I think just kind of educating yourself a little bit. I think it's um, Monterey Bay has their safe seafood guide as well, and they do it by region. So that's a really useful guide for um, kind of understanding what is a, is a better choice. Um, you also have to consider things like, I guess, salmon and tuna and it, things like that. They, they tell you to limit how many you have in a certain time period because of the potential mercury. So I think it's just really important to kind of consider where you're eating it. Um, and you can also just look it up before you go, like check out, maybe call the restaurant. I know it's a little extra work, but sometimes it's worth it to really understand what's happening. And, and a lot of places I see now really celebrate knowing where their food's coming from. Fish markets and restaurants will say, you know, this came from this location and it was caught like this. And they're celebrating the fact that they know that and they can tell you that. So those are awesome places to check out as well. Thank you. Yeah. 
I think that's true of not just seafood, but as you said, generally, like if the restaurant can't tell you where their food came from, maybe, you know, maybe you don't want to yeah. eat there. Or it's mislabeled, uh, you know, for a while there, um, restaurants were calling grouper and it's actually, it's a, it's swai, it's Japanese grouper, but it's swai, it's a freshwater fish. So it's not an ocean fish. Um, and so, uh, and, and it's tricky because at some point, where's the fault lie? Because if the chef thinks that they're cooking something because it's labeled as that and maybe doesn't know as much about what it's supposed to look like. And then the restaurant, whoever orders it, and then the, the fish market or however they get it, it's mislabeled. Is it mislabeled at that point? Is it the name changed at that point? Is it um, higher up at, you know, the marketing department and the wholesale level? Um, is it on the fishing boat? It's usually, you know, somewhere along the line, where is the misinformation, the mislabeling, where is that happening um, in the chain of demand? Um, and so kind of demanding to have a better sort of more accurate chain and on, like a paper trail of what it actually is and where, I mean, obviously if you look at a swordfish steak versus a snapper, you're gonna tell the difference, but there are certain fish that are, it's very tricky to tell. Um, and for the, you know, a person who doesn't spend time analyzing what fish looks like, if you go out and somebody says it's a grouper, okay, it's a grouper, I'll eat it. Uh, and, and you might not know. So uh, yeah, it doesn't, I don't think it takes a lot to kind of educate yourself on that and really businesses as well. And I think the public is pushing for that more and more. So businesses are starting to step up and say, you know, the public wants this. And if they're going to spend money at our, our establishment, we need to be able to answer those questions. And also we should be making sustainable choices as well. Thank you, Julian. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. And like I said, um, it's Sharks for Kids, uh, www.sharksforkids4.com. Check it out. We have all sorts of fun stuff. So if you guys have kids in your life, uh, friends, family that um, like different activities, and um, even if you know a class that wants a lesson, we do that as well. So, um, but lots of fun videos and activities. And then you can check out and follow the project as well on there. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening.